And uh, once again, if you've got your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, um, we're going to go to the Gospel of Luke. And let me set this up a little bit. Gospel of Luke, the first chapter. The first chapter of Luke's Gospel, Luke spends 80 verses setting up the Christmas story. And this is an important part of the Christmas story. And Zechariah, husband of Elizabeth, is a, is a major player. He's a major part of this. And um, I don't want us to miss that. Is it, I get it. Many times, uh, preachers and, you know, and, and people, we jump right ahead to the Annunciation of Gabriel talking to Mary. And we jump up then to Joseph and Mary and the, and the journey to, to Bethlehem. And that's okay. But I want us to hear about Zechariah. I want us to remember this act of God that Gabriel showed up to Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest, a holy man for the Jewish people. And it was his turn to be in the temple lighting incense and getting things prepared. And so he went in. And the people were outside waiting to come in and worship. And he went in and Gabriel, the angel Gabriel showed up. Like he's kind of like one of the angel all-stars. You know what I'm talking about? Kind of a big deal. And so Gabriel shows up and says, Zechariah, guess what? Your prayers have been answered. You and Elizabeth are going to need to get a nursery ready. You're going to need to get some diapers bought. You're going to have a baby. Finally, God has heard you. And Zechariah, holy man, Zechariah's going, what? I'm not sure. What are you, what are you talking about? And, and he, he doesn't get on board right away. And Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel. I'm like God's spokesperson. You, because of your doubt and because of this, you can't talk anymore. Now, for a pastor or priest, that's a curse. Are you with me? Right? You can't talk anymore for nine months. Okay? Um, and, and then you've got to name this baby John. And John's going to go on ahead of his cousin. And, and he's going to proclaim that the, he's the, the, the way, the truth, and the life. And people need to get their act together. Zechariah comes out of the temple. Everybody knew something was up. They had to. He comes out. He can't talk. Right? And so for nine months, like that's, it's biblical, the gestation period and all that stuff's the same for humans. Now, is it back then, nine months later. John is born. He still can't talk. Eight days later, they take John to the temple for the naming and for the christening and the circumcision. And the people say, well, what are we going to name this kid? What are you going to name this child? And that's where we pick the story up. It says in verse 63, Zechariah asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. And immediately... Zachariah's mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. Pause right there. Zechariah, going back to the angel Gabriel in the temple in nine months, he had experienced God. He knew God was doing something besides the fact that they had been praying and hoping for a son, a baby for many, many years. And Elizabeth was old, older woman. He was experiencing God and that experience of God moved him to praise God, moved him to do something. It says he praised God. Now, verse 65, the neighbors were all filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things that had happened. And everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Even the neighbors and the people around, they knew God was in the mix. They knew it was powerful. And so, and so they too became witnesses. You see how this ties in? Now, Zechariah goes on with this beautiful prophecy, this beautiful thing about John, his son, and about Jesus coming. And basically, in a nutshell, saying God keeps God's promises. God said he was going to deliver us. God said he was going to save us. God said it. And finally, a new day is dawning. It's happening. In fact, go down, if you're following along, verse 7. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. And then Luke says the child grew and became strong. And then chapter 2 is the birth of Jesus. Zechariah, he's an important witness, and I don't want us to miss that. Zechariah had a powerful experience with God. He had a powerful experience. You know, to understand being a witness, you can look on the screen is someone who go, gives testimony, right? So think of it like noun, like a person, like a court of law, a witness, someone who gives testimony or evidence, presents evidence because of something they 
have experienced. They have personal experience or knowledge. And then they verb, they, they, they furnish proof. They witness is a verb. They, they, they confirm it. They show evidence. In other words, Zechariah had this thing that happened to him because of God. And so Zechariah became a powerful witness. Okay? It changed his life. And then it says in the scripture, it says in the scripture that as he began to testify and tell people what God had done and that God was keeping his promise and a new day is coming in the King James Version. It's actually beautiful. It says that Zechariah in his song said, uh, because of God's great love, because of God's tender mercy, day spring from on high is coming Right? Like a sun, a new sun, a new S-U-N is coming to shine light on those living in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the ways of peace. Zechariah becomes a witness and all the people who saw him and heard him don't miss that. You see, it had an impact. It had an impact. So it says that the neighbors and the people looking at this were like, wow, like this must be of God. This is a big thing. And, and I always love to think about that like, hmm. So like 30 years later, when John the Baptist started his ministry and Jesus started his ministry, I always think about which, what kids and, and what young people and others were around, you know, the neighbors. And did they then connect the dots? I, you know, there's nothing written about that. I just wonder if Zechariah and Elizabeth's neighbors said, hey, you remember that? Remember that when, when Zechariah couldn't talk and then he could talk and we knew God was doing something and now here's this John the Baptist and he's kind of a weird guy. He lives out in the wilderness, he eats bugs and, and wears weird clothes, but you know, God is with him, right? Okay. I just wonder, they became test t uh, witnesses. Zechariah, I want to switch gears. See, he's teaching us about the power and the need. The power and the need for people who have experienced God to tell others, okay? It's not just the paid preachers and teachers and staff. Zechariah reminded me in this Christmas story that God has that need because there are so many people in our world who are far from God. There are so many people in our world who don't know God. There are so many people in our world who don't know the Christian community and the benefits and the power of being part of positive, authentic Christian community. And so Zechariah reminds us that there's a need for people who have had positive experiences of God. For people who know, who know, and, and it makes a difference in their life that God sent Jesus into the world to die for us so our sins could be forgiven for, for uh, us and we can be redeemed, we can be saved, we can be changed, we'll be given another chance because our sins are forgiven for us. People need to know that if you've had that experience and if that makes you happy. Zechariah reminds me that there's a need in our world, that if, if, if you, me, if people have experienced God's power and of mercy and grace, if you've experienced the peace of God that passes all understanding, that somehow just is a peace that calms you, that's in your home, that's in your heart, that you just sense, if you've experienced healing of God, if you've experienced God's ability to provide for you, to provide for you and to sustain you and strengthen you, you've got to share it. You've got to be a witness. And being a witness is a perfect gift. And that's my point today. It's a perfect gift, right? And it's a gift, the witness that we give about God or about knowing Jesus and forgiveness, about the benefits of being part of a Christian community. Again, it's a perfect gift. It's one of those that can be given any time, any season to anybody, no matter what age they are. It's like Emily, my daughter Emily's toys. Um, you don't pack it up. Don't put it away. Is uh, The witness that you give, that I give to other people is important. And it's a powerful thing. And I know it can even be a little scary. I can know it can be uh, maybe feeling burdensome. Look, I've been uh, living with this, thinking about it. Sermons always start with me. And I know that, that, that this truth... Is it, is it our kids, our grandkids, our neighbors, our friends, our fellow church members, other people? They, they're watching, okay? We watch and, and we, we uh, not like creepy. What is that, that sound? What is that big bass sound? Is Jesus coming again, like right now? Because, you know, yeah. Yeah, sound guys, take that out, please. It's distracting me, okay? Um, is, is it, um, <laughs> you don't want me to be distracted. We'll be here all morning. We'll have to bring in extra food. Bring in some uh, chicken salad to go with that bread, right? We're going to be here all day, okay? Listen, I know 
It's these two things. It's, a, it's scary when you think about our witness because we don't always get it right all the time, every single one of us. We don't always get it right, and we drop the ball sometimes and sometimes do dumb things. You agree with that? Say yes. But our witness counts. It counts with the people that we influence, okay? It's noticed by our family. It's noticed by our children. It's noticed by our grandchildren, if you have grandkids. It's noticed by your friends. It's noticed by your neighbors and, and, and fellow church members and even strangers. And again, I want to clarify, when I talk about giving a witness, when I'm talking about your witness to other people, I don't mean you have to get up and preach unless God calls you to that. I don't mean that you've got to get up and teach unless God calls you, that, calls you to that. I don't mean that you've got to go in your neighborhood and ring doorbells and tell people about Jesus unless God calls you to that. What I'm talking about and encouraging you is to um, uh, be mindful of your actions and your words around other people, especially if you have self-identified as a Christian or it's known that you are part of a Christian community. If it's known that you're part of a church. And so what I'm encouraging you to do, asking you to do, maybe even challenging you to do, and I've been challenging myself first, is to ask questions like, kind of like this, like, have my faith and experience of God, are they moving me to act and speak differently than those who don't know God? That's a question only you can answer. This is related to being a witness, right? Does my faith and my experience of God and my experiences in the Christian community cause me to make decisions uh, to go and what to do and how to respond. Do I respond and make decisions differently than non-Christians? It's, when we talk about witness, it's moving us to say, you know, let me put it this way. Does your experience in the church, in the Christian community, and does your knowledge and, and, and emotional, your experiences of God's grace and God's mercy, do those move you to act and to display things like gratitude and generosity and love and patience and courtesy. You know, we talked about all those things all fall along, including with the, uh, with the, 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 the uh, rock, uh, narrow road rules and talking about the fruits of the Spirit. That's what I'm saying is to be mindful. Is your experience as a Christian, is your experience in the Christian community moving you to strive to demonstrate Things like patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and, and self-control. Or to practice 1 Corinthians 13. Remember, that's not just a wedding scripture. This is a way we're supposed to act as Jesus' people every day. Patient and kind. Don't envy. Don't boast. All those kinds of things. That's what I'm asking. I'm asking about, I'm asking about your witness. And for you to think about uh, and, 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 and to maybe if you have, share a house with somebody to talk about that, to talk about that. And again, I know we don't always get it right. I know that there are times that our witness to our children or our grandchildren or to other people, I know that we drop the ball and we mess up sometimes, okay? But we have a God of redemption and there's second chances, amen? But it matters. And I'll say it again, it matters. Our witness or our testimony, even if we don't use words, that we give to other people every day matters because there are many people far from God. There are many people in our community who are far away from God and who need God, who need the church, who need to know about God's forgiveness through Jesus. There are many people who need to know about God's mercy. There are people that don't have a relationship with God through Jesus. There are people in our world that don't even have that moral code that Christianity and the church gives. There are people in need. And so here's the deal. Here's the hard truth, folks. Here's the, the flag that we put in to the hill on this hill, uh, this flagpole. Uh, it's worth fighting and dying on. You see, if the people who identify themselves as Christians... If the people who identify themselves as members of a church, a Christian community, if the people who call themselves Christians and the people who are members of a church, if we are not pointing people to God or inviting people to be a meaningful part of, of, of the living body of Christ, if we're not doing that, who will? Are you with me? Say yes. Who's going to? Are the public schools going to do it? And I'm not going to throw the public schools under the bus, but they're not, their job isn't to point people to God and to the church. You all understand that, right? Is it colleges, universities, that's not their job. Their job isn't to point people to God and, and to uh, the church and to Jesus Christ. Politicians and political parties, that's not their job. 
Their job isn't to point people uh, to God. In fact, maybe sometimes our politics pushes people away from God. Amen? Social activism, that's not going to point people to God in the church. I'm going to say it again. God created the church, and the church is made up of the people. That's us, the people who identify as Christians. And if we are not pushing people towards God, we need to think about maybe we're pushing them away from God. And that's where it gets hard, right? That's where it gets hard. Our witness. A couple of months ago, a woman in her 30s, you know, said something to me. It was kind of funny, and, and, but it's true. A couple of months ago, she had just commented. She said, you know, when I get older, I think she meant like me, maybe like, you know, late 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. But this was an honest thing from an experience that she had, several experiences, actually. She said, you know, when I get older, I don't want to be a grumpy, nasty church lady. OK, <laughs> think about that. That was her real experience. And I thought about that and realized, I realized, sadly, that is a correct observation. I've been a pastor and have had the privilege to serve in many churches for 33 years, okay? I know I don't look that old, Brian and Gina. I know you still think of me as a nice 40-year-old like Blaine, but I, I, okay, I've been doing this 33 years. Blaine, I started when I was seven. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, uh, in 33 years of serving a, a number of, of congregations in Louisiana, Missouri, and here in Iowa, and having thousands of church members that I love all of them, loved all those sheep and my sheep full. But I got to tell you, I've experienced both. I've experienced having uh, church guys and church ladies that were loving and positive and encouraging. And I don't mean they just because they were always nice to me or, or because they, you know, agreed with everything I wanted to do. I'm saying I've encountered some amazing, beautiful men and women in churches in all the places that I've been that were consistently positive and hopeful, and encouraging, and, you know, glass, glass, uh, uh, half full kind of people. I've, en I've encountered all those people, and you know what? They were all, and continue to be, wonderful people to be around. Does that make sense to everybody? Say yes. They're a joy to be around. You know, I can start thinking about some of those saints. You know, some of them have died. And man, they were just awesome. You know, I can think of some of those men and women. And, and, and there were different times I'd think, you know, if I had 10, I just need 10 people like that. And, you know, um, God will use us to build a church that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Amen? But I've also sadly, unfortunately, experienced my share of nasty, negative, mean church guys and church leaders. You can always pick those people out if you know what to look for because they, they're the people that have got 10-foot pole marks all over them. Do you know what I mean? That's the only joke I wrote in here. That 10-foot pole marks because nobody wants to be around them. Does that make sense? And people like just deal with them. Why? 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 And, and, and here's the thing. See, when, when I was 20, that's when I started being a pastor, a student pastor. I didn't get it. I was so naive. Like grumpy Christian, that's oxymoron. Those two things aren't supposed to go together, Right? Mean, nasty Christian? That doesn't work. But what I've found and what I've discovered, sadly, are people in the church who are seldom satisfied. People who constantly, constantly are pointing out faults and mistakes. And, and instead of you know, having a positive word to say, they find the word that's a, 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 a put down or is how somebody messed up. They're the people in the church, the ones that are always have sore toes because their toes are always getting stepped on. Y'all know what I'm talking about? people that have thin skin, people that are ready to fight, people that are ready to stir things up and to get their way and are horribly judgmental. I've encountered those people and some of you have as well. And here's my point. That kind of witness in the church pushes more people away from God and more people away from the church than it will ever attract. If you agree with that, say yes. So here's the scoop. I would hope that I'm saying to every church guy and church lady, if you want to have a little goal in life, perhaps have a goal not to be the grumpy church lady. Amen? And perhaps have a goal to not be that guy, that grumpy church guy that always finds fault, always complains, never does anything, expects everybody else to do it, and then complain about it. I'm being serious as I can be because I'm talking about witness. See, it's good to consider if our words and our actions are a positive testament to our relationship with God and God's church or not, okay? Because a perfect gift, a perfect gift that we can give to our children, our grandchildren, to our friends, our neighbors is evidence, is evidence 
that being in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ matters is the most perfect gift we can show to people. And yeah, if you've got kids, I keep hitting this because, you know, I love teaching confirmation class right now. I have got some of the most cool, awesome confirmation kids, ninth through 12th graders that said yes to being in confirmation. And I love being with those kids every week, right? But every week it reminds me of the power of parental, parental influence. Y'all know what I'm saying? I get one hour a week with them. Parents, you get at least, what, three, four, five hours a day with them, no matter what age they are. Your influence, your witness, your impact on your children is going to be 15, 20, 100 times bigger than mine. If you agree with that, say yes. This is why years ago I had said to our parents group here at Grandview, my job isn't to disciple your children. My job is to help disciple you, help God disciple you and grow you. You need to grow your children and influence your children as as Christians. That's parents' job and grandparents' job. And I'm sorry, but I'm of that that generation. I'm of that, I guess, kind of stubborn uh, 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 um, group of people that says, you got kids in the house, they don't get to choose whether they come to worship or not, or Sunday school or not. That's your job as parents, and you can hate me if you want, but that's where I'm going to stand. Amen? Believe it or not, I've had kids say this. Like, hey, I've missed you in church the last three weeks. And like, well, the kids didn't want to go. It's like, Really? Who's in charge? Who's in charge of your home? So I'm serious, folks. Witness. It's a perfect gift, and it matters. It matters because there are people far from God all around you. And the things that we do with our kids and our grandkids is is making a difference right now. And the way that we live and the things that we say and the way that we behave in the church and outside of the church is having an impact on on people like neighbors and coworkers and friends. it, it, It matters, okay? So here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you're sitting here today and you realize that you're not and maybe have not been a positive witness, then maybe you realize down deep that you've not been a positive witness to the benefits of being an active follower of Jesus. If you're sitting here today and thinking, you know, there's times that I've really messed up and done some things outside the walls of the church or sometimes inside the walls of the church that if I really want to be honest, have probably pushed some people away from the church and away from God. Here's the good news is let not your heart be troubled. There is hope with our God. See, what our God offers, and that's partly what we're coming to remember at this communion table, what our God offers is a chance for forgiveness and redemption and an opportunity to to do better next time. That's what our God offers. Our God also offers the great comforter, the Holy Spirit energy that will give us uh, the words to say and, 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 and give us the, 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 the like supernatural ability to make better decisions. And, and, and God offers all of that. So if you're thinking, I've done some dumb things, me too, me too. But our God is a God of redemption and other chances. So this Christmas, my hope and my prayer for all of us, I pray that you have the opportunity to give the gift of a relationship with God through Jesus. I pray that you have the opportunity to give this perfect, long-lasting gift of a relationship with the living body of Jesus, the church. This Christmas, your words, your actions shown to others, your witness, your witness to the grace and the power and the peace God gives, it's a perfect gift. May God help each one of us give it every day. Let's pray about that, please. Lord God, Uh, You know us as we are and who we are. And you know the things we struggle with. And you know the things uh, that that, that drag us down. And the things that break our hearts. And the things that make us cry. You know the things, Lord, that rile us up, wind us up, and make us be angry and hateful and hurtful. You know. So, Lord God, I pray that you forgive us. In the name of Jesus, forgive us for those times when we have not been our best self. Forgive us, Lord God, if in any ways... We have pushed people away from you. If any ways we have pushed people away from your church, Lord God, forgive us. And as forgiven people, Lord, grow us and help us to do better. Work through us, speak through us, use us for your ends and your objectives. I pray, Lord God, that you help each and every one of us know you more, that we can shine you brighter in the darkness of this world. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, we all pray out loud in one voice. The prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.